Hello. Um, it's very moving, actually, to be able to introduce Laurette Savoy in person. Um, her book, uh, Trace, is one of those that after you read it, after I read it, stayed um, lodged in me, marked me somehow. I, I don't forget her voice. <clears throat> I don't forget the traverses across the continent that she traces in the book. And to hear her speak some of the words from the book in her own voice, and it is a book that is deeply in her own voice, to a degree I hadn't understood before I heard her read from it last night, is a very um, intense thing. Um, Laura is joining us tonight uh, as part of a project um, of lectures and multi-year interdisciplinary collaborations that my colleague Norman Wirtzba and I um, are assembling under the title uh, Facing the Anthropocene. What we mean by that um, is to propose a kind of uh, stock taking of a situation in which the planet has entered a new geological era. Um, etymologically, the era of humanity, in which people have become a force, arguably the force, in shaping the development of the world itself. In this stock taking, we're trying to take this immense transformation and refract it into many questions that people can hold more concretely in their minds and in their hands. What shall we make of this change? So we'll ask together, how should lawyers, that's my training, think differently in a world in which the boundary between human beings and everything else is more porous and mutually constitutive and shifting than ever before? How should we think about the ways that the power and architecture of law shape the land and that the land shapes people who live on it? in return? How should political theorists think about the boundaries and responsibilities of nations in a world that's radically precarious and interdependent, and in which the idea that politics could be simply the concern of human beings in some kind of isolation seems more and more implausible ethically and practically? How might economists think about what value is and about when an economy is succeeding and producing well-being? And how might historians think about both the deep past of geology and the recorded and remembered history of human projects in the same picture? Because increasingly, we're changing the world's natural, chemical, biological systems at the speed at which we're living at the speed of history, at the speed of politics, at the speed of technology. Um, one of the many things <clears throat> that Trace does and that Laurette Savoy does, I think, in her work as a writer and scholar and a, an utterly distinctive kind of intellectual and artist is to ask versions of this question. What does a history, what does a form of memory look like that sees the land and human beings as shaping one another constantly, dynamically? What do that history and memory look like when they recognize that the land, in that it remembers in its shape and its chemistry and the life there, it remembers how people have lived on it. It carries how people have lived on it. How do we consider the ways that that makes the land itself a record <clears throat> of injustices and crimes? That it's been claimed on the basis of erasure and expropriation. It's been settled on the cornerstone of expulsion. It's been built up with the wealth of exploitation. And you can trace all of this on it 
And how do you consider the fact that for all of that, it's still the place that shapes us, that you cannot simply leave it? Even if you leave it, you cannot simply leave it. You carry the shape that it gives you. As she writes in Trace, when her family left California, she reflected, if I could gather sunlight and stones, if I could keep Pacific water from spilling or drying up, then home would come with me. And home does come with us in its gifts and in its injuries. The late poet Czesław Miłosz um, wrote once that there's no memory, perhaps, he said, perhaps there is no memory except for the memory of wounds. And this book, Trace, is a recollection of wounds. And it's also a record of a difficult love for wounded places and for histories in which loving something involves us in its history of wounds. We're all in this history. We're in it in different ways, held together by it, held apart by it also, in ways we acknowledge, ways that some of us don't acknowledge, maybe in ways that none of us have yet figured out how to acknowledge. But facing the Anthropocene, among other things, is facing one another. And that is the task and the question that I understand Laurette Savoy's work to be addressed to. Um, thank you for being with us. Um, thank you so much. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, can you hear me fairly well? Good. I, I want to thank you all for welcoming me. Uh, it truly is a gift to be here uh, at Duke University in North Carolina's Piedmont, in a land of deep history, uh, the homeland of the Eno, as well as a land that found itself under the grip of tobacco for a long time. I'm very grateful to Jed Purdy and to Norman Werspa, Mari Jorstad, to Kate, where are you? Kate Avendrell, and to all of the staff of the Keenan Institute for Ethics, as well as the Loose Anthropocene Project for inviting me and for making this visit possible. Uh, I also give my thanks to the Katz Family Women Ethics and Leadership Fund for supporting this visit. To be part of the Facing the Anthropocene project, uh, following on the heels of Bill McKibben's visit last fall, is really an honor. And like you, I am grappling with what it means to be a citizen of Earth. It goes without saying that we live in an unprecedented time. Human beings have become a dominant force in global environmental change, responsible for altering the world's atmospheric, oceanic and land systems, and each of us here could make a long list, from global climate change to an accelerating rate of extinction, losses to biodiversity, changes to global elemental cycles like nitrogen, carbon, the list goes on. Yet in this country, disintegrated thinking and living and a fragmented understanding of human experience leave too many realizing why any of this matters. That is, realizing that it doesn't matter. It doesn't part of their lives. Yet it is. And how do they come to understand that is key. So I'd like you to consider these words by biologist E.O. Wilson, uh, who wrote, and these are his words. Our troubles arise from the fact that we do not know what we are and we cannot agree on what we want to be. The primary cause of this intellectual failure is ignorance of our origins. So I struggled uh, to come to what would be most, most worthwhile to say here. And besides, I suspect many of you are wondering, well, who is she? Uh, 
So let me just offer a few words that reflect on the Anthropocene in ways that may not often be considered, words that ask us to think about history and who we are. And to give you a sense of who I am, I'd like to tell you some of my own path to understanding, a path that began in childhood through an alien land and land ethic to my recent work in Trace. As a young child, I imagined that I was a horse, and I don't know if any of you did that as well. I was a wild Appaloosa, so full of speed, and I would run fast up and down sidewalks, around playgrounds in our yard, just to feel wind rush with me. But when the world moved beyond sense, I began to run from what I feared. Riots near our home in Washington, D.C. left burnt, gutted remains of buildings I knew. The war in Vietnam joined us at dinner each night as TV footage of wounded soldiers, of crying women and children, of places with names like Khe San, My Lai, and assassinations of men my parents called good men meant that anyone, my parents, my friends, or I, could disappear at any time. I learned before I was even eight years old that hate could be spit dripping down the front of my favorite homemade dress. Hate could be a classmate sing song, never saw nothing as ugly as a nigger, never saw nothing and as crummy as a nigger, his eyes on me. I then ran, not just to feel win, but in hope it would blow away whatever it was about me that was bad and hate-deserving. Safety lived in my room, in my mother's arms, and outdoors in nature that never judged or spat. Teenage Encounters with two books by authors who also seem to be sinking uh, helped me begin to understand. Published in the same year, midway through the century of the First World Wars, the books became oriented compasses for me decades later as an adolescent trying to understand my place in America. And I met them question to question. Aldo Leopold's Sand County Almanac was a ninth grade assignment. We had to read it the, the summer before entering ninth grade. And I knew nothing of the book being called Landmark. I knew nothing of it being called an almost holy book in conservation circles. What appealed to my 14-year-old sensibilities were intimate images of land and seasons in place, as well as a seemingly open open, opening of this man's struggle to frame a personal truth. In the chapter The Land Ethic, Leopold enlarged the human community's boundaries to include soil, water, plants, animals, or collectively the land. And though I couldn't find words then, his call for an extension of ethics to earth relations writ large seemed to express a sense of responsibility and reciprocity not yet embraced by this nation. His ideas forced new questions, and they suggested troubling possibility. If, as Mr. Leopold wrote, and these are his words, obligations have no meaning without conscience, and the problem we face is the extension of the social conscience from people to the land, then what part of this nation still lacked conscience broad enough to realize an internal change of mind and heart, to embrace what he called both an evolutionary possibility and an ecological necessity? Why was it, and this is what I wondered at age 14, why was the United States I knew so cruel why were people so cruel? And what I feared most of all was that the we and the us in Aldo Leopold's book excluded me 
and excluded other Americans with ancestral roots in Africa, Asia, or Native America. The other book, published in the same year, midway through the century of world wars, found me by accident. It was in the basement stacks of my university library near the end of my first year there. The author, Willard Savoy. The title, Alien Land. This was my father, then dead two years. This was a book he never told me about, written long before he met my mother and many years before my birth. And it is an account of an embittered, multiracial boy becomes man who wonders if he might escape racial hatred and his own demons by redefining himself as white. Because in the language of the day, my father could pass. The alien land that my father wrote of grew from what he called the hypocrisy, which in one breath preached the doctrine that all men were created free and equal, and in the very next breath denied to millions the simple respect which should naturally go with such a belief. I understood then that I too lived in an alien land. And the questions that I had as a 14-year-old became an 18-year-old's need to understand why such hypocrisy and inhumanity continued. A child born today enters a world of rapid and extensive change, and the list is often repeated. Ecosystems around the world have never before been so fragmented and degraded, resulting in great losses to the diversity of life. Fossil hydrocarbons literally fueled industrial revolutions and the mechanization of food production. And because of this fossil fuel economy, Greenhouse gas levels continue to climb, exceeding the highest atmospheric concentrations since our species evolved. The pace and degree of such environmental changes are unprecedented in our human history. Yet, the embedded systems and norms behind them in the United States, the most energy consumptive nation, are not. Their deep roots allowed and continue to amplify fragmented ways of seeing, valuing, and using nature as well as human beings. Consider the ecological footprint. It's often described as a sustainability indicator, yet its estimate can mask how exploitations of environment and of people are actually intertwined. Quantifying the area of productive land and water needed to provide ecosystem services or resources that are used, like clean water, food, fuel, and then the waste generated gives only a partial measure of the biosphere's regenerative capacity. And by this measure alone, humanity's footprint far exceeds Earth's ecological limits. But, but, American prosperity and progress have come at great human costs as well. Forced removals of the continent's indigenous peoples yielded land to newcomers from Europe and their descendants. The New Republic's economy grew upon a foundation of industrial agriculture built and powered by enslaved workers, north as well as south. Consuming other people's labor, dispossessing other people of life and land connection to it, devaluing human rights and diminishing one's community, autonomy, and health. These are not just events of the past. The health and lives of farm workers in pesticide-laden fields are rarely recognized as a cost of producing cheap food. And in a still globalizing world, 
American agribusiness giants like ConAgra have profited from the products of enslaved labor in Brazil at what might be considered a seemingly safe moral distance. A wiser measure of the ecological footprint would include people, or at least their labor. It might factor in losses of relationships with land or home, losses of self-determination, and losses of health or life. What if the footprint measured over time on whom and what has this nation's foot trod? Or in other words, who has paid for prosperity? I believe that each of us is implicated in this country's still unfolding history, whether we are a recent immigrant or a native, whether a descendant of colonists or a descendant of those enslaved by colonists. The power to segregate memory and knowledge and the power to segregate people have always worked in concert. And what's left are fragmented and fragmenting narratives of human experience and of the history of the land itself, all of them weighted by tangled ideas of race and of nature. For example, did you know that the writings of some who escaped slavery in the early to mid 19th century, Frederick Douglass among them, considered how the oppressive agricultural system of plantations, really a form of industrial agriculture, distorted human relations to the land, degrading the soil as well as the enslaved and the enslaver? Did you know that? Or did you know that more than a century ago, Zit Kalasa, a writer of Lakota Dakota heritage, and Sarah Winnemucca, a writer of the Paiute, described the very close ties that they saw between the racism that was shown to their people by some Anglo-Americans and the environmental attitudes that led to the degradation of what had been their indigenous land. Did you know that? My book, Trace, began in my struggle to face questions that long haunted me, questions about origins, about how this country's still unfolding history has marked the American earth, has marked the society, and has marked me as an individual questions about what it means to be a responsible citizen of this land, but also the earth. I write in the book that sand and stone are earth's memory. Yet each of us is also a landscape inscribed by memory and by loss. The paths taken by my ancestors began on three continents to converge in me, with free and enslaved Africans arriving in the Americas in the colonial period, with colonists from Europe, many of them the enslavers, as well as with tribal peoples indigenous to this land. Yet these familial origins lie largely eroded and lost even though as an educator and earth historian, I have tracked the continent's deep past from rocks and fossils, those remnants of that much more distant time. I came to understand that the past I come from, the past that all of us emerge from, is broken and pitted by gaps like the fragmented annals of earth history. But in my case, the gaps were left by silences stretched across generations, by losses of language and voice, by human displacements due to, po not possession, but dispossession, and by losses due to forced servitude. These gaps were also caused by immeasurable dimensions of lies that were compressed and deflated under the weight of ignorance and stereotype, 
as well as by dismembering narratives of who we the people are to each other in this land and on this earth. So my struggle to face haunting questions became a mosaic of journeys and historical inquiry that crossed the continent as well as time to grapple with a searing national history and the marks it has left. From twisted terrain within the San Andreas fault zone to a South Carolina plantation. From an island in Lake Superior to Indian territory in black towns in Oklahoma. From a colonial town in Massachusetts that was built on the back of enslaved workers. To national parks and burial grounds from the origins of names on the American land and why we carry these names still to the origins of the U.S.-Mexico border and our nation's capital. Trace takes its title from the active search, from the paths of the journeys, from the vestiges of what once was. Trace also means to make one's way to follow, to pursue, to discern, to discover, so both noun as well as verb. And each chapter is an essay that is an attempt, like individual spokes of a wheel, converging toward a center, a point of understanding. By crossing borders, by crossing borders of discipline, thinking, and voice, Trace reveals often unrecognized ties between the past and the present that touch us all. And it just then tries to counter some of our most damaging and oldest public silences. And a case in point includes the sighting of the nation's capital and the economic motives of slavery. And of course, grounding all is the earth. And for me, trace is a form of doing geology, that is, coming to understand Earth and our places on it more fully. For this continent's human history owes much to the history of the land itself, to the land structure, its materials, and its textures. And geology also offers metaphors for considering the deposition and erosion of human memory and the fragmentation and displacement of human experience. I agree with Wendell Berry and others who believe that we, in the largest sense, the most recent biped hominid species, 2,000 or 200,000 years on Earth, now face a crisis of culture, a crisis of character, especially now exactly a half century beyond the assassinations that frightened the very small child I once was. I think there are many things that undergird all positive efforts to live responsibly in the Anthropocene, whether working to eliminate threats to bi biodiversity, whether working to cut oil, gas, and coal consumption, as well as the power, working to cut the power of the fossil fuel industry. Yet I also think that one of the hardest things to cultivate in this nation for each of us is a capacity to ask significant questions about our lives in the context of this nation over time, as well as in a larger world, and to ask significant questions about lives that are not our own. Still, I think our future, again, in the largest sense, depends on it. So what I'd like to do is turn now and end with a few words from a chapter in Trace that considers the Anthropocene, Aldo Leopold's land ethic, as well as my father's alien land. Another ninth grade summer text was Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. I hope some of you know that book. 
He was a survivor of Auschwitz and other Nazi camps who became a leading psychiatrist in post-war Europe. And at age 14, I became obsessed by the last two sentences of his book. And these are his words. Our generation is realistic. For we have come to know man as he really is. After all, man is that being who has invented the gas chambers of Auschwitz. However, he is also that being who has entered those gas chambers upright with the Lord's Prayer or the Shema Yisrael on his lips. Frankel believed that, and again, these are his words, every man is questioned by life, and he can only answer to life by answering for his own life. To life, he can only respond by being responsible. And he added that everything can be taken from a man but one single thing the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's way, and thus evoke his will to meaning from its state of latency. So at age 14, I wondered what Frankel's words of choice meant for someone like me, for my generation. Could one choose between ignorance and innocence in such a world? In the passing years, I began to doubt any emergence, any possibility of an emergence from a state of latency. I doubted whether Americans as a whole could choose to answer these questions broadly. What and whom do you love and respect? To what and whom are you responsible, obligated? Respect from the Latin for the willingness to look again and again with assumptions put aside. Responsibility, meaning the ability to respond, the capacity to attend, to stand behind one's act and conscience from the Latin for a joint knowledge or feeling to come together to know. I wondered if obligations have no meaning without conscience, without an acceptance of moral responsibility, then what is possible? Now I would like to think that I can imagine that it is possible to refrain from disintegrated thinking and living from a fragmented understanding of human experience on this continent and in this world. I think it's possible to refuse what alienates and separates and to be able to see in fugitive pieces the forces that have shaped the land and ourselves in it. And of course, there's always the danger that I'm fooling myself. But if it is possible, then perhaps a larger sense of who we are as interconnected ecological, cultural, and historical beings could begin to grow. For if the health of the land and the earth is its capacity for self-renewal, then the health of the human family could, in part, be an intergenerational capacity for locating ourselves within many inheritances. As citizens of the land, of nations, even within a single nation, and as citizens of Earth, democracy lies in ever-widening communities. And questioned by life, each of us is held to account. So I want to thank you and also say that I'm very honored to be here and uh, I'm grateful to learn with you and from you.
and I hope that we'll have a wonderful conversation now. Thank you. Thank you. This is very complex, folks. Okay. I, I love playing musical chairs as a kid. <laughs> so what, what we're going to do now is uh, Jed and I are going to engage uh, Lorette in some conversation, and we will then invite you to ask questions as well. So be thinking of things that you would like to ask. Uh, and, you, and, you, and I also want to apologize because I almost lost my voice a little bit earlier, and I was so deathly afraid that Every sentence I began would end in, <laughs> and so uh, thank you for helping me stay on the path. So first, thank you, Lorette. You've given us so much uh, to consider and multiple points of entry where we can have some conversation. So I want to pick up a little bit about your reference to Aldo Leopold. First, I need to say I'm astounded that you were reading Aldo Leopold as a 14-year-old. Uh, I was not even thinking about such things as a 14-year-old, so you're to be commended for that. So, but it was a school assignment. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so one of the famous lines of Leopold is that to be an ecologist is to see a world of wounds where everyone else sees a beautiful landscape. And the idea is that the education that one undergoes as an ecologist alerts you to the reality of things, and that this education will have a number of dimensions. You pointed to some of them, this effective dimension, uh, a, a sort of strict observational kind of knowledge, an imaginative capacity so as to think about sympathies expanding beyond, say, just kin group, or then tribe, or then nation, and so forth. And now thinking all the way to a kind of citizenship with non-human creatures. And yet what your book shows so powerfully is that while he's looking at the world as an ecologist and seeing wounds, he was in, unable to see culture and see the wounds. Was he unable or did he Well, this is, this, is, I, this is a question that I'd like us to, to pursue and have you think about. What, what sort of deformation, if that's the best word, I'm not sure, or is it a negligence, is that a better word? Or a blindness? What is, what's going on in his, in, his, in his work, do you think, that made it unable for him to see the, the human wounds written into the land when he was so careful to try to describe the wounds in the land that were of some other uh, sort of origin? I think that's a hard question, uh, but it is a question that in, in some ways, in a 14-year-old's in terms, I had when I was a child. It was a question that I, I wanted to ask him, why? And I didn't want to presume that it was because of uh, a decided reluctance or an inability, because I, I didn't know. I hadn't read any of his earlier work. Uh, but my, my friend and colleague, Kurt Miney, who is an Aldo Leopold scholar, um, and I know many of you may know him, has shown me texts where he actually is contending with what is going on, mm. um, not in a San County Almanac and not in the land ethic, but in other writings. Uh, but when I was 14, reading the opening to the land ethic, and those of you who are familiar with it, realize that he, uh, he begins with the, the example of ancient Greece and slavery in Greece. And I couldn't understand, well, if, if you're talking about that or writing about that, why not address what is happening or has happened in the United States? So I, again, as I wished those years ago as a teenager, if he could join us, uh, because I think he might have a lot to say. Uh, he did not put it in that book, but there could mm. be many reasons for that. Mm. But he was thinking about it mm. elsewhere, uh, especially given the times from the 1930s into the 40s with the, the, uh, the war in Europe uh, and then in Japan overseas and then the United States being involved, uh, just the escalation of conflict and what that meant too because of so many nations being involved in this. 
So I don't want to say he didn't. Mm. Uh, we need him here to tell us. Yeah. You were also talking in, in relation to Leopold about education, right? How, how do we imagine the kind of education that will equip us as people to have the requisite kinds of sympathies to, to sense the wounding that is going on, uh, to develop a kind of perhaps solidarity, I don't know if that's the word to use. And Leopold speaks, I think, in a very provocative manner when he talks about how we're not going to learn to care for what we don't first love. And so I'd be interested to know what your reflection might be about the role of love in education moving forward and how you think this love can be a, a kind of power to transform the education we might need for this Anthropocene moment. Love coming from where? That's a good question. No, that, and I think it's, it's a big question. I, I agree that in order to care, there needs to be a connection, a relationship, uh, and love uh, as a term really means intimacy. It means being in contact. It means a reciprocal relationship uh, because it, it can't just go one way. So how is that established? Uh, and it's a question I'd like to throw to you, too, because it sounds as if you, you were talking about in your class. Right, I guess I was, yeah. <laughs> so that's why it's on your mind. Well, I, I think it's an important matter because, uh, and you know, people can chime in here in your conversation with us about whether or not there is much place for love in the curriculum as we experience it, uh, and what, what sorts of capacities for affection and sympathy are cultivated in knowledge acquisition as a kind of commodity activity? Uh, or are we thinking about something different? I, I think that's worth talking about. And how we then would cultivate these, not just cognitive approaches to affection, right. but what sort of bodily placements are we talking about? Are we talking about taking students physically in embodied ways into the place of wounds? Are we talking about engaging them in the lives of the communities where the wounding is, is happening? Are we talking about opening to them to a kind of historical formation that requires a kind of staying with a place in the course of time? Uh, I think those are all questions to have on the table. And uh, you, you just reminded me of a, a wonderful conversation that you were there with yesterday. With the, uh, I had a chance to have uh, lunch with uh, some of the law students here, and it would be wonderful to have their sense of given because they're, is it L1 or 1L? The latter. Yeah. First year and second year law students who might say or worry that in their curriculum so far there hasn't been room and there isn't room given the structure of what they're, they're trying to learn or what teachers are trying to give. So I would be very curious to know of how there might be room. Are there some things that you've done in the teaching you do at Mount Holyoke that help your students trace a landscape with you? Does that kind of thing happen? Because much of what I write and trace, I, I said at the beginning, it's, a, it's a, a journey that is personal, but it's also a journey through history uh, to understand uh, the marks of history on each of us. And so what we do, or what I try to do, is have students investigate for themselves what matters most to them. We could begin with questions about what is home, and not in the sense that it's your address, 1253 Redonda Boulevard, um, or not in the sense that it's where your parents live or where you necessarily grew up. But if you think about your connections to the past to present on this land, through your grandparents, your great-grandparents, or even through what you have taken into your life as far as what you've learned in classes, just how you navigate your world, uh, what is most important and what is home. It also begins with the question of how you would define yourself as an American or as fill in the blank. What are the most important things? So it really begins with what they th see or feel is vital and then to ask questions of themselves that perhaps they didn't try to articulate before. And many of them uh, go home and then ask their parents and their grandparents, 
and are grateful to have the permission to ask what they thought they would be denied responses to. So much of what you've, I didn't, did I? No. Oh, I wasn't sure. Um, so much of what you've written seems to me to begin from something Leopold says in that passage. Before he says that we'll preserve only what we love, he says that we'll love only what we understand. And you've made a kind of new and more radical reckoning with what it is to understand a landscape and what else one has to understand, I think, to, to, to understand it. Um, when, we, when we talk in the register that some of our conversation has had so far about conscience, <clears throat> personal reflection, respect, origins, and the taking of responsibility, I think a lot <clears throat> about the intense guardrails that the world sets up, how, and how powerfully it tells people materially how to inhabit it, you know? So for each of us here, there are literally hundreds of tons of built world, hundreds of tons of infrastructure, yeah. highway, power plant, utility line, agricultural soil, and to eat and to move around and to participate in our culture and to stay warm and cool, we have to enter into those systems. And the less visible systems tell us to who to step on or whose step it, step it onness to accept, to, to, keep, to keep moving. Um, so I, I wonder, when you think about collective political acts of reparation, of repair, that could make everyone possibly freer to be more responsible, give them more space to be attentive? Do you well, think do you that's think possible? That? Do you really think that's possible? Yes. Okay. Yes. How? Uh, I'm going to turn it right back on you. <laughs> I was trying to remember whether it was Viktor Frankl who, before the heart of the war, wrote the socialist decision. I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, it was one of those German existentialists that humans, it might have been Fromm, but it was one of those okay. two. Um, I, I guess it's a, it's a way of saying that conscience gets freer in the world when it's joined to a politics that tries to get hold of the big house that we make and all have to live in, either, either willy-nilly, right? or that is sort of coerced implicitly by it, or by seeing it whole and trying to shift it a little. Right. I asked, do you really think it's possible because it seems that so many divisions or separations or segregations are taken for granted as the norm in this nation and in some ways have been reified in the last year. Yes. Uh, and it's not that I'm saying it's not possible, but I think it really begins with understanding first who we are. And how to do that really means, in part, that some people who have built a sense of who they are, who have told stories that define their heritage in a particular way. And I don't mean some people as if I'm pointing to them. Anyone who tells a story of who they are frames it. They, they decide what's important to include. But any decision to include something also is a decision either accidental, uh, not deliberate, or deliberate that requires leaving things out. And oftentimes, what is left out is a sense of difference, a sense of other ways, a sense of other possibilities, a sense of stories that may contradict what you might think is valuable. Uh, and I know this sounds very abstract, but if I can give you an example that I write of in here, 
It's a visit to uh, a plantation in South Carolina um, <clears throat> near Spartanburg, and it's uh, a plantation that's on the National Register of Historic Places, and it's widely used both for field trips, educational field trips, as well as virtual field trips. And the story that is told on this plantation, which began in the, six, the 1760s and then went uh, using uh, an enslaved population uh, to 3,000 acres all the way through the Civil War, the story that is told only focuses on the Revolutionary War period up until the year 1800. And it's a story that speaks of the valor of the Revolutionary War heroes and the people who established the farm. But nothing, and I do mean absolutely nothing in the told story, mentions those who worked the farm to produce the wealth that allowed them to have 3,000 acres of a cotton plantation. And it seems as if the memory that that was told was passed down over generations, and that memory still is the public story. And what's most telling, in it, if I could just add this, uh, that really struck me was walking to the plantation cemetery. Uh, it goes through a pathway through woods, and you find these beautifully cut marble footstones and headstones that are very well tended. The area is dusted, it's sweeped, it's, it's uh, roped off, so you don't tread on the dead. But if you turn around and look into the woods, you see fist-sized stones that extend out into the woods like stepping stones. You can count them. One, two, three, four, 10, 20, 30. And those mark the graves of those whose voices aren't part of the told story. And so there's a vested interest in maintaining a narrative of who you are to celebrate, to uplift, if you think that ancestors in some way reflect who you are now. Can you also add the story of those who allowed the wealth to be built? What would be the cost of doing that? What kind of cost would there be? So I think it really comes back to acknowledging that there, there's a web, a tangled melange of experiences that need to be voiced in order to reach that point. And right now, oh, I'm so worried that it's not really at the forefront of many people's minds. Here, from the perspective of a filmmaker and a still photographer, and years ago, I'm from the Appalachian Mountains, and I am um, of African and Native American and European descent. I might not look it, but I am, and the DNA shows it. And so, I did a film a long, long time ago about a group of people called Melungeons, and they are triracial, um, although I, I, I despise that term, but that's what they've been called for years. I prefer the term multi-ethnic. And when I was researching for that film, I came across notes from a person who was sent into the mountains in the early 1900s as a scout for the coal companies from up north. And when he came into the mountains, one of the thing, one of the ways, one of the things the techniques he used to get people to sign over their mineral rights was to hang over their head the fact that they might have African or Native American ancestry. It, it's despicable. And in his diary, there are things, there's, he wrote, yes, there are a lot of mountain niggers here. And that's the way he was able to get people to just kind of sign away their rights because they were afraid of what he would do. So, so I, I'm intrigued so much by your point of view and as an Appalachian coming from a place where an extractive economy has just, you know, run rampant over the people and then left the landscape scarred and the people are still there. But, and I won't talk much longer, but fast forward a bit. After the film, I, I started a still portrait project, and it's called People and Their People. And um, I am dedicated to photographing people, holding photographs of their ancestors, and I've emphasized people of that, I've emphasized finding and illustrating people who are of mixed ethnicity. 
um, and it's hanging right now in Baltimore in the American Indian Museum, and um, I'm hoping to continue to grow the project. But that's one way that I'm trying to keep the stories alive of people who might look white and, and grew up white, but can I help them recover the stories that got silenced? Um, and for me in particular, I, in the 1600s, one of my European ancestors married a Shawnee woman so he could be part of the fur trade and on and on and on, and her history is lost to me, yet his is all documented. So anyway, I just wanted to cite that. Good luck with that and thank you. I think we'd like to open it to conversation from you all or questions that you would like to, to offer. We, we have more things that we can talk about, but we also want to give you an opportunity to ask. So if you'll raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. So while, while you're thinking about a question, I, I have one that I, I would like to still ask. You end your book with a very provocative statement, which you say, remembering, re-membering, is an alternative to extinction. And could you say a little bit more about what you mean by this remembering? Is this a way of, of talking about, is reconciliation a word that you would pair with it? Or is it a kind of healing that you're envisioning here? Um, and the question is important because of what you just said about how when we bring the traces of violence onto the land uh, to memory and we bring them to each other, this creates difficulty. And what, what does remembering look like in, in that kind of a context? I think it, it in many ways, is, uh, for me, at least the first step before healing. It contributes to that and to reconciliation. Uh, I think it, if you think about truth and reconciliation, it's a way to begin to get at that truth, that multi-layered, or not even layered, that, that extremely tangled truth. The Latin root of, of, or the Latin, if you look at the etymology of remember, it means the piece together the body again, to put it back together. So for me, remembering is piecing together the fragments. And the fragments are, in part, as you said, some of the lost stories. But they're the fragments of history that many people may not think about together, because in some ways, perhaps, we have been taught to think about them in disciplinary silos. Uh, for example, thinking about nature and race together, and the history of both on this land, which involved commodifying the land as well as commodifying people. It involved dispossessing people of the land as well as extracting from the land and seeing how all of that is tied together. So I think it's, it's tying the pieces together, or not tying them as if they're over there. It's recognizing how they've always been tied but perhaps that's not how we've learned about them or have thought about them. So that's what I mean by, by that. And an al as an alternative to extinction, that's really based on my beginning this. As I said, I began it as a struggle, not knowing who I was, not knowing where I came from, because I grew up in a family that did, did not speak of its past, never. Who we were, where we were, who we were to each other. Uh, and because of that, having that lack of base, but being bombarded by images from the media school lessons as a child that effectively taught me a history that didn't make room for who I really was, uh, that I felt that I was not just homeless, but in some ways an alien species, that there was no place for someone like me here unless it was fitting into a designated category that others imposed on me. So the alternative to extinction is really coming to know who you are in this place and to rise beyond those narratives that try to compress, deflate, and erase you. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> any, any questions or comments about anything? Or they'll start, they'll keep out. <laughs> yes, please. Hold on, hold on. Oh, 
Thanks. I haven't, I haven't read the book, but I was kind of interested if, if you had reflections on architecture in relation to this whole um, discussion. I mean, I, one of the things that struck me moving here from the European context is um, the ways in which, not in big cities, but outside of big cities, kind of quotidian architecture is often deeply tied into the stone that was available or very different kinds of um, ways of making a place in the world and, and how that's reflected in how people lived and how it's connected to the land um, and everything from where your graveyards are to, uh, you know, those, those kinds of things. And so there's this deep sense of, of a kind of interweaving of place, land, architecture and people. And it's always struck me moving here that you, there's a kind of quotidian architecture which seems to have no relationship to the land. It's you know, rather similar houses or strip malls or, or whatever. And it, it, there seems to be a deep fracturing between the structures of how we live together and, right. and the actual place and land. And, and, and yeah, I just was interested if you had any reflections on, on that, because that, 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 the, the very walls we're in seem to me often speak of a kind of alienation from, from a, any deep connectedness to the, to the land. That's a, a great question, and I, I don't consider it directly in, in the book, um, partly because I, I haven't s looked at it enough, but it's something that I have reflected on. Uh, if you think about architecture, you could also think about language as a structure that is developed in response to or in relation to where we are and how you want to live. And so I, I do consider language a bit, but with architecture, um, there, if, if you're not familiar with her, um, she's a landscape architect named Anne Spurn. Have you, do you know? Uh, and she has been at the University of Pennsylvania. I don't know if she's moved. But one of the things that she has noted, and I know I'm going to misquote her, uh, but I think this is the, the gist, that trying to understand how to function with the earth, and that includes building a domicile to protect you from the elements, and a domicile that would allow you to live comfortably, is partly a response of a conversation with your environment, and that the, t the earth was the first text to all humans, the first text and original and aboriginal languages arose from that. If you think of architecture in that way, you could think of architecture that originally was responsive to that landscape, again, that reciprocal relationship. But then when a margin allowed to be developed that you did not have to be as closely attentive to the weather, to the systems, that you had a way to distance yourself, as you said, then you could build track houses that really have nothing to do with the lay of the land. In fact, you have the power to change the lay of the land to fit your needs. And it's going back or understanding that original starting point and then moving up. And that's something that, that she has done. And your question's a great one. Uh, it's one I've been interested in, but I, I haven't looked at in detail beyond seeing what others have done. Have, has anyone else considered that at all? Architecture? <clears throat> I, I wondered whether you would be willing, and you may not be, to reflect a little. I mean, I don't mean <laughs> no, to put you on the spot. That way. <laughs> <laughs> um, to reflect aloud on, on your own ambivalence or even pessimism about what kind of political commonality could be possible here, is possible here. Here being? Being the United States, where we're trapped together in citizenship and non-citizenship <laughs> and infrastructure. Yeah. It, I, it's not ambivalence and it's not pessimism so much as I don't know if it's possible. And I, I would say it's more not knowing. The hope is there. Mm. How to achieve that hope? I don't know. But I think the barriers first need to be overcome. And 
there have been so many attempts at overcoming barriers across this nation's mm -hmm. history where you seem to be rising up and then you get pulled back. Uh, let's think about the, the time after the Civil War, um, the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, uh, a time of promise, a time of hope, not only for those who were recently freed with the end of the war, with the 13th Amendment and the end of slavery, but the sense that there could be equality, the beginning, radical reconstruction, the Republican, Lincoln's party after the war tried to put in place a system where there could be a beginning for everyone. And what happened? What happened? Effectively, Jim Crow pulled us back, and you needed the 1964 Civil Rights Act to reenact what had been enacted almost a century earlier. And now were we again? So it's not that I don't think it's possible, I just don't know how to achieve it. Because what you said about being trapped, maybe we need to think about how to break open the trap. And maybe someone here has some ideas. And I hope I'm not sidestepping it, because that's, that's a tough question. A tough Have there question. been things along the way that you've seen that keep igniting the hope in you? Steps that you've seen, I mean, more recently in, in your own experience? Oh, with, with students? Yeah. Uh, with students who are not, not satisfied with just learning, but they need to do, and they need to understand what this means to be a responsible citizen, and to be a responsible citizen, meaning someone who has the capacity to act and then go out and act, that, that is key. Mm -hmm. But then they come back and say, well, I'm only one person, what can I do? And, well, I know we talked about this a bit at dinner last night. Uh, to say that you're only one person <clears throat> and let that stop you I think is the crime or the loss. Do you see a role here for a kind of community action? Are there places, yeah. for faith communities or particular NGOs that you find inspiring? I think the list is endless, mm -hmm. uh, but as far as uh, of, of groups, mm -hmm. um, from small grassroots local communities to large organizations, I mean, you can. You could even look at something like the ACLU or the NAA, um, NAACP Legal Defense Fund or people who have over, over a long period of time have been working towards not so much equality but to justice. Uh, could there be a movement? Of course there could. But I don't know what that is to begin. Uh, and it's, it really is because this last year has thrown me for a loop. Mm -hmm. If I can be honest, mm -hmm. it really, it's, it seems that every day something happens that I thought, had I thought about it two months earlier, I would think it's not possible. Yet it has been. It has become possible. And I hope that in that way there is a resilience or a sense that enough is enough, that there are boundaries that are unacceptable. Uh, for all of us. But at what that point that is, I'm, I'm not really sure. I wonder whether we could talk a little about, <clears throat> about the literal landscape of public memory. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it keeps coming at me, um, because as a lawyer, I've been attending to the Trump administration's effort to strip national monument status from Bears Ears in Utah, which is also an erasure of local tribal sovereignty and, and Navajo history, among others there. Um, Navajo, Hopi, yeah. Zuni, yes. the, the, everything. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Ute, Mountain Ute, yeah. Uh, exactly, yeah. those four, exactly, mm -hmm. in Bears Ears. Um, mm -hmm. And as a person who lives in Durham, I've been aware of the civic heroism, to my mind, of the people who took down, in a very orderly way, the Confederate statue at the courthouse. Um, 
The making of a landscape that is intended to remember, a memorial landscape, is such a, an important part of the building of different versions of commonality. If you were a kind of, you had a kind of 21st century Teddy Roosevelt's capacity to write a landscape. You of mean memory. our president? Yes, oh. yes, and you have one of those great laws that says you can just carve out pieces of the land and, and say these Gifford are places Pinchot where we working remember. working for me? Is he going to do what I say? Your, you get to pick your version of a Gifford Pinchot. All right, all right. <laughs> I, I noticed that, that uh, a new friend whom I uh, met yesterday, Charlie, you're, you're here and you're working on a project um, and I think some of our conversation may influence what I'm thinking of right now. Um, I think every place in this country is a site of memory a site of memory for some particular group um, or for an individual, whether it be a site of uh, something very deeply personal to you as an individual, a site of uh, a family having homesteaded or developed in a place, a site of a group who perhaps had to move there or moved from there, uh, a site of memory for having visited national parks or monuments or any unit in the national park system. Uh, what I would want is for sites of memory to be recognized that memories can be of many different forms and that, let's say, a site of memory like Yellowstone National Park, many people think of it as a site that, well, it's the first national park. Uh, it's a place of wildness. It's a place of endangered species. It's a place where you can enjoy geysers. It's a place for recreation. But it's also a site of a memory because in order for that park to have formed, the Crow, the Shoshone, the Bannock had to be forced out of it. And so it's a site of memory for them as well, but a site of loss. And they were moved to reservations. And the first superintendent of Yellowstone said that Yellowstone is not Indian territory. And some of the first workers in that new national park were African Americans. And none of these stories, they're just not told. So for me, in my power as president, um, I think one of the things that I would try to do is to help us understand how the entire nation as a whole, as well as in individual pieces, are sites of memory that include gain for some, loss for others. That are sites that can include love, but also hate. That are sites that involve interactions among people that have occurred over decades, over centuries, over millennia and that we need to, we, writ large, if we are to understand what it means to be citizens of this country, and I don't mean the United States so much as the land itself, that we need to understand what these memory sites are and what they mean as far as what we think we are. So I would begin there, um, not necessarily with national parks, but they're mm -hmm. a good starting point mm -hmm. because many people know them. Many people know them. And I do a lot more with my advisors, yeah. who would be handpicked, <laughs> and probably some people from this audience who'd advise me. Yeah. Other questions from you all? Or comment, yeah. or anything about yeah. anything. in your book and <coughs> excuse me you mentioned again today the idea of sand and stone as being memory and today um, you and I looked at soil together I have an image of your mind of you actually tasting it eating it with 
And as somebody who grows food with soil, I think about soil as being fungible, right? I think the beauty of growing food and restorative agriculture is the capacity to change soil in some ways for the better. And I wonder, in terms of thinking, your own thinking as a geologist, as, as mineral, as being um, changeable on, perhaps on a different time scale or as a site of memory, can those memories be transformed? Or another way of thinking about that would be, where, where does soil fall in that sand, rock, memory mm. continuum? I think it's, it's part of it. It's not just sand and stone and memory, but soil is memory. Especially soil such as what you, you were working with on this, uh, this ancient metamorphic Piedmont. I mean, we could, we could talk about the Carolina Slate Belt and the geology, and therefore the origin of the minerals that then contributed to soil as they were weathered and eroded. But there's also the memory of how that soil then was used, how it was harnessed, and what that meant as far as the loss of nutrients, the degradation, literally the degradation of the land, as well as those who worked the land. So I think that is one example, Saskia, of, of how the memory of Earth, or uh, the site of memory, links the natural, the geological, and the human. And I think every place links them even though the link may not be obvious to some, it's definitely there. So can the memory site be used, and we talked about this, to heal? And I think that is a beginning to understand the ways in which the forms of memory exist from deep time, deep geologic time, because soil is the memory of what it was made from, the ancient metamorphic rock but it also is part of our lives and how has it contributed to our lives, meaning tobacco being grown around here. And connecting the time, connecting the elements and the human equation as part of that, I think it's vital. But doing it in a way that does not diminish or degrade or in some way put down the con perhaps contradictory narratives that come to the fore, but a way to recognize and honor why they exist and to in thereby be able to engage in dialogue. That's key. And maybe that gets to repairing and reparation. Not reparation in terms of money, but repairing in terms of connection and understanding the connections that have been segmented or broken because of imposed difference, whether that be by law, whether that be by racism, whether that by be any other forms of othering. But soil is key. Soil is the basis or one of the bases of life. And it's an opening because of that. Just following up on that, would you, would you talk a little bit about how there has to be a kind of almost embodied engagement with the soil to come into the memory of the soil so that the kind of memory that would simply be a storytelling about soil might not be quite enough. So you and I both love the work of Robin Kimmerer who, mm -hmm. who speaks about how in giving our love to the land in the form of nurturing soil in the work of gardening, for instance, right. one comes to the experience and the knowledge of the land loving us back and a kind of conversation exists then between the land and the person and that that might be the sort of embodied work and affection that creates the conversation in which something like the recovery of memory and the healing of memory might be possible. Do you think that would be right? I think that would be right. I think it would also uh, involve recognizing that that type of love, that type of deep, intimate connection with soil even existed with those who were forced to work the land for its yield. Mm -hmm. For you can think about um, perhaps and just thinking of the, the plantation I visited, that enslaved Africans may have worked those fields to produce for that, for the, the landowner, but they also had their own intimacies with land by having their own gardens, by having their own subsistence patches that they defined, that they created, that they controlled. 
So gardening, even within a larger system of industrial agriculture, was vitally important for that personal intimacy that was defined on their own terms. Mm -hmm. And so recognizing that as part of, and it, it makes the whole thing, or you recognize how, how complex it is that even with oppression, there is choice. Even with degradation, there is life and nourishment. And having all of that okay. as part of the narratives, that's really important. And yesterday you also said something fascinating about how your experience with the land was such that even as it bears the traces of the violence that people have done mm -hmm. on it and in it, the land doesn't hate you in the way that people do. do. And so the, your engagement with the land, while it's an engagement with the violence that's traced in it, can also be a kind of encounter which becomes a kind of healing mm -hmm. power. If you're making that a question, the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I think you're right, I really yeah. do. Uh, the engagement with the land can't occur in just one form. It must be in many different forms. Uh, and perhaps forms that uh, are not typically what any of us would, would have thought. But I think it's, it's, it's required. And that includes engagement with the built landscape, too. Mm -hmm. Last opportunity. Oh, over here. Hi. You made it. <laughs> Hold on, let me fix this. Um, uh, I have a number of related questions. Um, one is that humans are kind of limited in their capacity to understand, and any story necessitates a frame. Like you said, you leave things out by choosing to tell what you do. Um, but I kind of wonder how far in scope those stories can be and if they can or should involve speaking about other people and other people's stories. Um, and I guess I wonder how do you do that well? And um, how do you know when you've understood enough to be able to start speaking? I can't speak for, I can't speak for anyone else. And I think what, what's the most important thing for me is to be in conversations that are based on mutual respect and understanding and trying to make sense together of our lives in place. And so examples in here uh, of those who are alive today are in their own words. It's, it's not me speaking for them, but it's, it's really trying to bring to the fore or bring together a multiplicity of voices and a multiplicity of ideas and perspectives. Um, and it's with the historical characters, the ones with whom I, I mean, I, I, I don't have a time machine, and so I can't go back and not just talk with people, but even be in a time to understand what that time was like. Um, it's relying on the writings that they had. Uh, and then with the land, with that, I have to admit, it's based on my, my geoscience or earth science background, just recognizing what, what minerals, what textures, what the lay of the land that we see here means in terms of understanding its deep history, in terms of understanding how it has influenced human action. But for me, what, what I think is really important is not speaking for others so much as trying to allow their voices to speak as well. Um, and not being an editor, not being a filter, but being open. And that's the only way I'll learn. Um, I need to be in dialogue to make sense of anything. And that's the truth. Mm -hmm.